Nou, welkom allemaal bij uh, dit programma. Het is in het Engels, dus dat uh, zeg ik even van tevoren. Um, en we gaan nu beginnen. Dus uh, welkom to um, the Holland Festival Negritude Program in collaboration with Black Renaissance. And Black Renaissance is a collective of critical thinkers, artists, philosophers, activists, scientists, historians, and womanists. We develop programs about non-Western philosophy, epistemology, art, and culture. We aim to open new windows onto the world so that people can form different imaginaries about themselves and other cultures. My name is uh, Antoine Du. I'm one of the co-founders of Black Renaissance and your co-host tonight. And this is... My name is Patricia Karstenhout. Uh, I'm also uh, affiliated to uh, the Black Renaissance. Um, maybe can, we can have the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start with this uh, painting of uh, Wilfredo Lam. I don't know if you know him, but he uh, was a, a Cuban painter. And he was uh, affiliated to uh, the Surrealist. And um, this painting is about, uh, it's called The Jungle. And uh, in this painting, he uh, depicts his uh, African um, uh, ancestry and heritage in relation to the plantation and uh, in relation to the plantation and uh, slavery. And uh, uh, surrealism was a very important part of the negative movement. And that is the reason why I thought it would be nice to start with this beautiful painting of uh, Wilfredo Lam. Okay, thank you, uh, Patricia. Um, we are very honored and proud to have these amazing scholars uh, for you tonight. We have uh, Joseph uh, Jordan and Ines van der Scheer, and we will introduce them in more detail a little bit later. They will, de they will join the panel of speakers uh, later this evening. We have 20 times second loud. A group of very talented musicians and singer-songwriters who will perform for us later on. But to set the stage for our dialogue, we have invited Professor Tracy Dean and Shapley Whiting uh, as our special guest from the United States. And uh, Gras Nijako will kick off the evening with an introduction into negritude. Gras is an author and philosopher with a focus on African philosophy, literature, political and black feminist theory. She holds master degrees in arts of philosophy and political science, and she's also one of the co-founders of Black Renaissance. Please sit back and enjoy the mini lecture on negritude by Gras Najaka. I will start out with a poem, a poem by Emé Césaire. I'll start off with a poem uh, from the MSSN. I'll start out with a poem by MSSN. 
Des mots Ah oui, des mots. Raison, je te sacre vent du soir. Bouche de l'ordre, ton nom, il m'écorole du fouet. Beauté, je t'appelle pétition de la pierre. Mais ah, la roque contrebande de mon rire. Ah, mon trésor de saint Parce que nous vous haïssions, vous et votre raison. Nous, nous réclamons de la démence précoce, de la folie flambante du cannibalisme tenace. Trésor, comme ton, la folie qui se souvient, la folie qui hurle. La folie qui voit, la folie qui se déchaîne. Et vous savez le reste, que, que des et deux font cinq, que la forêt miaule, que l'arbre tire les marrons du feu, que le ciel se lise là-bas, etc., etc. The segment is from Cahiers de Retour au Pays Natal by Aimé Césaire. It is considered by many to, to be the seminal work in Négritude. Because it is here that the word negritude is mentioned, mentioned for the first time. In this part of the poem, Césaire, Césaire rejects reason. So, um, reason, I will sacrifice you to the evening wind, is what he says in the poem. By reason, he means, he means French Cartesian reason, which, it, which the writers of negritude consider to be an oppressive reason. A reason that signifies constant separation between object and subject, body and mind. He embraces mad madness, the madness that remembers, the madness that sh shouts, the madness that sees, the madness that frees itself. Thus he proclaims that two and two equals five. Negritude was a social and cultural movement that arose amongst black writers and poets from the French colonies in the Caribbean and continental Africa and Madagascar, who met each other in Paris in the 30s of the, of the 20th century. This movement was a response to the French, col col French colonial enterprise and its policy of assimilation. The advent of the European in Africa was a sh shattering experience as, a, as colonial rule meant a drastic reordering of African communities and cultures and cultures and, reorder, and a reordering of human relations. It was a political and social reorganization of African communities. Thus Irela, Irela notes that colonial rule substitute, substituted new poles of reference for social organization and individual life, which were often in conflict with established traditional pattern and thus created a society which appeared to possess an essentially non-authentic character. So this was the historical context in which the writers and poets of Negritude lived and to which they reacted. It was a refusal and denial of an imposed world order and a wish for, for a cultural different, differentiation. Thus Césaire said, we lived in an atmosphere of rejection, and we developed an inferiority complex. I have always thought that the black man was searching for his identity, and it has seemed to me that if, we want, if, if what we want is to establish this identity, then we must have a concrete consciousness of what we are, that is, of the first fact of our lives, that we are black, that we were black, and have a history, a history that contains certain cultural elements of great value. The next poem I want to read out to you is, uh, Leon Dama, is by uh, Leon Dama. It is about the rejection of assimilation. It's called Sol. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule dans leurs dans leurs souliers, dans leurs smokings, dans leurs plastrons, dans leurs focoles, dans leurs monocles, dans leurs melons. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule dans leurs salons, dans leurs manières, dans leurs courbettes, dans leurs formules, dans leurs multiples besoins de sacherie. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule, ridicule avec tous ceux qu'ils racontent jusqu'à ce qu'ils vous servent l'après-midi un peu d'eau chaude et des gâteaux embrumés. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule avec les, avec les théories qu'ils assaisonnent au goût de leurs besoins, de leurs passions, de leur instinct ouvert la nuit en forme de paillaison. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule, parmi eux complices, parmi eux souteneurs. 
par mieux égorgeurs, les, les mains effroyables, effra, effroyablement rouges du sang de leur civilisation. Dama, in this poem, rejects French attire, rejects French customs and culture, and as he feels ridiculous wearing and expressing them, and even feels uh, uh, like he's uh, betraying mm -hmm. and be, uh, being immersed in the blood of the, to the, that comes with their civilization. Negritude was also about solidarity amongst black peoples over the world. It's about the history of a community, their history of the deportations from one continent to another, their memories of beliefs that came from afar, and the remains of their assassinated cultures. So there was a belief in the value of the collective memory of black peoples, and even a collective unconsciousness, subconsciousness. So Césaire said to not believe in this notion that one arrives in the world with an empty mind, just as we don't arrive with empty hands. There were living values and lived experiences amongst black peoples. So negritude is also memory, fidelity and solidarity. The writers and poets of negritude were themselves heavily influenced by black American writers that made up the Harlem Renaissance, such as Langston Hughes, Ellen Locke and Claude McKay. Senghor even went as Leopold Senghor, the uh, Senegalese poet from the Negritude, even went as far as saying that it was W. E. B. Du Bois who wrote his who wrote his book The Souls of Black Folk, published in 19, uh, 1903, that he was the true founder of Negritude. <coughs> About the solidarity amongst black peoples, Césaire said, "I understood that I could not be indifferent to what was happening in Haiti or Africa." Then, in a way, we slowly came to the, to the idea of a sort of black civilization spread throughout the world. And I have come to the realization that there was a Negro situation that existed in different geographical areas, that Africa was also my country. There was the African continent, the Antilles, and Haiti. There were Martinicans and Brazilian Negroes, etc. That is what negritude meant to me. The last poem I will read is by the Haitian poet Jean Fernand Brière, and it is called Me, Re, Me revoici Arlem. So, Me revoici Arlem. Frère noir, me voici, ni moins pauvre que toi, ni moins triste ou plus grand. Je suis parmi la foule, l'anonyme passant qui grossit le convoi, la goutte noire solidaire de tes ours. Nous connûmes tous deux l'horreur des négriers, et souvent comme toi, comme moi, du sang des couvertures, couvertures, se réveiller après le siècle meurtrier et saigner dans ta chair les anciennes blessures. Nous avons désappris le dialecte africain, tu chantes en anglais, mon et ma souffrance, au rythme de tes blouses, danse mes vieux chagrins, et j'ai dit ton angoisse à la langue de, de France. Quand tu, sais, quand tu sais Harlem sans coupre sans mouchoir, quand tu souffres, ta, ta, plainte en moi, ta, ta plainte en mon chant se prolonge, de la même ferveur et dans le même soir. Frère noir, nous faisons tous deux le même songe. So in this poem, he highlights the similarities in experiences of his black brother in Harlem as that are similar to his experiences as a black man in Haiti. That although he may sing, that he may um, express them in English, as he does in French. He may express them through the rhythm of the blues, as he, as he does through his own music. But they all have this, the same dream. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this uh, beautiful short lecture, and I really appreciate that you um, used the, the poem as a starting point to explain uh, negritude in a very beautiful and profound way. I want to introduce our uh, next uh, guest. Um, I'm a big fan of her work. Uh, she's, her name is uh, T. Dion, uh, Dinian Sharpley Whiting, and I'm currently <coughs> doing a fellow research, um, and I'm 
actually using her work for uh, my own research, and it's such a great honor uh, that you are here. Uh, she's a distinguished professor of African American and Diaspora Studies at, uh, and, French, and French at uh, Vanderbilt University, where she also chairs African American and Diaspora Studies and directs the Kelly Hauser for the study of global black cultures and politics. And she's the author of several books. Um, I call it, I, I just name a few, but there are many, many more. Uh, black Venus um, and uh, Pimps and Holes Down. Uh, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> I like the title, but it's also, I think it's a very good book. <laughs> so please, Tracy, would you take the stage and, um, you know, share your beautiful work. Okay, so we've had this really wonderful overview of Negritude by Grace um, that take up, took up the problems, or at least some of the ideas, and the problems taken up by the Negritude poets who we typically associate with three founding fathers, right? Um, Césaire, Sangor, and Léon Damas, right? And he's, of course, the one who doesn't get as much publicity as the other two, um, when in fact it was Damas who introduced Césaire and Sangor to the African Americans who would later go on to profoundly impact them. Um, so what I find particularly fascinating when we think about the historiography of negritude, which is effectively a pan-black or a African diasporic movement that is both literary and cultural, and by the 1960s took on political kind of terms and political um, manifestations. Um, but it effectively, it was a movement that emanated out of a French experience in which black people didn't necessarily know how to articulate the difference that they felt uh, in the context of the French uh, metropole as well as in the context of the islands, the various islands and former African colonies in which they had come from. Why wouldn't they have, why didn't they have a language around this identity that was called black? Primarily because the French, one, don't keep statistics according to race. Everyone is either French or you're not. Um, and two, they did a very good job with the idea of assimilation. Very different than the US context in which there was segregation. Right? And people were very clear about what was black and what was white, even if they really didn't know what was black and what was white. Right? There were a lot of black, white passing blacks and black passing whites. Um, and so we had the one drop rule even to try and get it down to you know, the core of you know, if someone's father, great grandfather, whatever. So oftentimes it, often, it became, it wasn't the color of your skin, it was the race of your kin. Um, and so oftentimes if you couldn't have a visual idea of what blackness meant and you couldn't classify anyone, one would begin to kind of look at records to determine blackness, right? Because it was, there was fear and that one would appropriate white identity and white identity in the context of the United States was extremely valuable, right? It was no less valuable in the French context. But the difference was is that the French were very much about assimilating is that Gloria back there? Yes. <laughs> All right. The French were very much interested in assimilating people into the idea of Frenchness, right? And the French believed, you all gonna make me duck, I'm from the United States now. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm about to pop off. Um, so uh, at any rate, um, so they were very much interested in the idea of going willy-nilly across the globe colonizing people, interacting with people, right, and pressing their culture upon those individuals because who wouldn't want to be French? <laughs> right? The 19th century philosopher Jules Michelet says effectively that everywhere they go with sword in hand, they teach people what it means to be French, right? And of course, most people laugh at that line. He says, don't laugh, don't laugh because it has been quite effective. That every time we leave a place, when our armies leave, they are effectively French, right? Um, and so these people who've been colonized by the French, um, who have been taught that nos ancestors are les Gaulois, right? They are the French, they're the Gauls, um, have no relationship or no understanding exactly about Africa, the slave trade, um, they do fundamentally that there's some kind of inequalities. They understand that there's a legacy of slavery, um, but they are still very much tied to a French identity. And so the educational system supports that identity. 
um, et cetera, the um, economic policies. Certainly we see on the island in which there are certain blacks that are in positions that are quite, uh, who are educated and are never allowed to occupy certain positions on the island of Martinique, for instance. But nonetheless, there is there is very strong tethering to this French identity um, and not to this notion of blackness because there is no language to articulate blackness or the idea of what it means to be black in this context. Um, and so they come to the French metropole. Right? And all of a sudden, they are experiencing something they've never felt, you know, experienced before. They certainly had it on the islands. They certainly had it in Africa. They see the inequalities, but it's never, ever articulated in, in the context of race. And yet, they know that there's something different about their Frenchness. They're French, but not quite. Um, right? So no matter how well Césaire speaks the French language, and of course Breton even says that in his introduction to the notebook, right? That here's a man who speaks the French language like no other, right? He can handle the French language, right? And so there are all sorts of stereotypes about how the black tongue can't necessarily, you know, really grasp the French language, and so the yardstick of Frenchness is thrown up and black people always come up short, right? No matter how French they believe themselves to be. Um, and so they don't have the language. And so all of a sudden, they interact with these black expatriates. Right? Um, and in that context, they began to understand that, well, the difference is actually their skin color. Right? And they've been taught, of course, that blackness was always associated with Africa. Right? And so there's also this very interesting class dynamic uh, functioning between West Indians, right, French West Indians, and those who were formerly colonized, right? And so the French West Indians were French, right, when, you know, they were considered French, whereas, and citizens, right, even in the context of colonialism. Whereas in Africa, various parts, if you weren't born in certain parts of Africa, you were not a French citizen, right? You were a subject. Right? And you did not, you were not entitled to the same rights. And because of those differences, when they arrive in the metropole, you know, as the people will do, they will jockey for position. Right? And so the West Indians believed that Africans were inferior and blackness was associated with Africa. And therefore backwardness. Although the West Indians themselves felt very different in the metropole. They were not treated as the same French citizens. Right? And so with this, um, kind of feeling with this encounter with African Americans that in which they were introduced again with by the mom, but also introduced by the Paulette the Nadal sisters, Paulette Nadal and Jane Nadal. We're oftentimes we're oftentimes kind of papered over in the history historiography of negritude. Um, so these sisters are also Martinican. They come to France. Um, they of course already speak English. So Césaire and Sangor, um, Dama of course speaks English. Um, but, or at least better English, those two do not speak any English at all, right? And so these sisters began to help negotiate that African-American world for them. They introduced them. They helped translate. They host salons. They are writing well before the Negritude poets are writing about this black identity because they can read the work, right? Jay Nadal sits down at the defense of um, Anna Julia Cooper, right, who was a black woman who received her PhD from the Sorbonne. Uh, and she says, wow, I have become a recolored woman, right? And so, because of course she had never thought about herself as a colored woman, and so she, she after listening to this defense of this African-American woman, defending in French, right, who is, you know, uh, a fairly, is an older woman, right, um, who is taking up this question of race, was talking about Haiti, um, and what's going, what went on in the Haitian Revolution, this question of race and blackness and the, and the violence of the Haitian Revolution um, on the part of the French. Um, so, so nonetheless, she sees this and she, of course, decides this is a very different kind of experience of blackness. Right? She embodies a different kind of blackness. And so she brings it back to her circle. And she's, of course, in a circle of women. Um, and they open it up to these men and allow these students, because Cesar and Sangal and Damal are still students at the time, so that they can begin to engage with these black American writers. Um, McKay, uh, as you said, Locke was very important. Ellen Locke was also very important. So it changes their world and their way of thinking. And there are several essays that are fundamental that come out of these, this time period in the early 30s, which is, of course, Black Internationalism, written by Jane Nordahl. And she's the first one out of this group to articulate this kind of pan-African um, idea. Right? 
um, and that blackness is on the global stage, and we have to start thinking about blackness in the context of the global stage. Right? And this is of course, and in this context, she also mentions Ellen Locke's book, *The New Negro*, which again, as the poets are beginning to think about themselves, they're like, we are the nail nail. Right? The new Negroes, this is what they say in French, before they come to this idea of negritude. Um, the other essay is um, by Paulette Nodal, right? and that essay is um, published ooh, wow, in 1935. Um, it's been translated a number of times, but it is effectively, the title is um, about essentially black students and the, the, race, the, the arrival of race consciousness among black students. Right? Um, and so she does a kind of historiography of um, the ways in which the black Martinican um, and others of the diaspora are coming into race consciousness and beginning to write about race and beginning to feel proud of being black because that's ultimately was it, what, it, what, what it was. It was not a rejection of whiteness or Frenchness. But they desperately wanted to cling to their Frenchness because it is who they were. Right? There was not a rejection of their Frenchness. It was simply an adding on to their Frenchness right? in a way in which uh, the French would object to because they don't like anything multicultural. But nonetheless, it is very important that they begin to recognize, recognize themselves as French blacks. Um, and with that, they, of course, with the oncoming war, uh, various publications flourished at this time in Paris. Uh, and they returned home and they began to try and proselytize and talk about blackness um, uh, on the island of Martinique and in different places in Africa, which became, of course, very difficult, right? In Africa, it was difficult because you had so many different groups, right? Tribes spoke different languages, et cetera, et cetera. And again, trying to get to this idea of race. People did not necessarily did not think of themselves as raced, right? And in the context of Martinique, again, it, were, it was an uphill struggle because people were still thinking of the Africans as somehow being the black ones, the bad ones, et cetera. Um, in hindsight now, there's a film, of course, by Paulette Nodal about her life, um, and people are talking about the ways in which she attempted to um, force uh, the various populations to grapple on the, on the island, to grapple with this notion of race, and to grapple with their blackness, and to accept their blackness, and to be proud of it, um, and not necessarily to uniquely identify with a white French identity. It's only a French identity, but to recognize that Frenchness itself was um, multicultural and diverse. Right? That it was not one thing, no matter how it had been defined for centuries. It was never one thing, even in those centuries. At the moment that it had contact with other cultures, it was impacted by those cultures, no matter how much the French want to believe in the purity of French culture and Frenchness. Um, and so with that, I'm going to conclude, because I probably think I've gotten close to that time. Uh, and so <laughs> I'm going to uh, turn, I'm sorry. Eight minutes. Oh. Eight more minutes? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I had plenty of that. I was told I had 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so, well, then I can kind of continue on if you don't mind. Um, what um, I can kind of go into a little bit more with the, um, with the returning of the poison, well, actually with the kind of historiography, I've just discovered um, when I was writing the book, well, I didn't mention Suzanne Césaire, who was also very important, but Suzanne Césaire comes later, was the return to the island, right? And she's Aimé Césaire's wife. Um, and a very brilliant woman who, of course, um, is in the shadow of a very brilliant man um, and suffers as a consequence. And so she is not rediscovered um, until much later when we do the historiography um, and still is often papered over, for, her genius is often papered over in, in um, you know, in deference to Césaire. But nonetheless, when they returned to the island and they found another journal, Suzanne Césaire, of course, encounters André Breton, right? This is between the interwar period. Well, it's actually after, this is at the onset of the war in which people are trying to escape France, right? Vichy France, uh, we have the French France is partitioned in two. You have the free France, and then you have the Vichy collaborating France. Right? And so people are attempting to get out of France, so, because they're going to be persecuted. Um, and so Breton, André Breton, the great surrealist writer, who of course takes up Freud, uh, he was originally a doctor, um, or at least he studied medicine, um, and served in the French army, and he began to read Freud and wanted to explore the unconscious. And with that, he began to develop theories out of the unconscious, right? Automatic writing, automatic painting, right? In which people would just kind of write from what they felt. Right? Not necessarily thinking long and hard before them and sitting down or so and writing and saying, I'm going to write this. 
but simply write or simply paint. And oftentimes what came up were those things that you often repressed. Right? And this is pure Freudian. Although Freud and Patricia and I were discussing this, rejected the surrealist a very out of hand, he said, that effectively when he looked at surrealist painting, he saw the consciousness. <laughs> he did not see the unconscious. So they were quite shocked um, that the person who, whom they worshipped actually rejected um, their embrace of his theories of the unconscious. Um, but nonetheless, who cares? You know, you get your inspiration from wherever you get it from, um, and you move on. And that's essentially what Breton and his group did. And so they are being persecuted because artists were being persecuted as well. Uh, and Platon escapes um, um, along with Wilfredo Lam, um, whose painting you saw, The Jungle, and others. And they end up in Martinique. Right? And it is as Breton is browsing a store that he discovers um, a journal. Um, and in that journal are several essays by Suzanne Césaire. And others, of course, and Césaire himself. And he's really struck also by the letter that they write, the Vichy regime, that is attempting to repress the journal by not providing them paper to print the journal on. And so he has to meet these people. And in particular, he's taken with Suzanne Césaire. And of course, as everyone is, they talk about how beautiful she is. As beautiful you know, as a, you know, the, the flame of a cocoa punch, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, he recognizes her brilliance, but that's, about, that's the line we get on Suzanne Césaire. So then the men go off. Um, and they do these you know, kind of interesting things. Um, but it is actually Suzanne Césaire who carries the torch of surrealism. Césaire is a wonderful poet, but he is not a surrealist. Right? He was not a surrealist. Um, he, was, he, he simply was not a surrealist. He did not embrace or articulate surrealism in the way in which Suzanne Césaire actually embraced it. Um, and so many, as of late, have been coming back to her work um, and reviewing it through a surrealist lens. Um, and because Cesar was pretty much actually in the tradition of what he attempted to found. He was a part of this new black tradition, right? Emanating out of the United States, um, emanating out of American context, bringing it back to a French context, and really about embracing his blackness, right? And those are the things that Cesar, it wasn't that there were certain tropes of surrealism that you would not find um, in his work, but that wasn't really who Cesar was. Uh, but Suzanne Cesar was quite the surrealist, highly theoretical in her embrace, sophisticated um, in her discussion of surrealism and articulation of the meanings of surrealism and what it meant for the islands, what it meant for artistic work, um, be it visual or literary. Um, and so once they return, of course, as I said, Breton is there, Wilfredo Lam is there, and then, of course, Lam ends up in Cuba. Uh, Breton ends up, of course, visiting him in Cuba. And of course, there's a kind of flourishing in that particular moment as well, as negritude is kind of taking hold, we know that Césaire has all written Notebook of Return to My Native Land. In that particular work is where he first mentions the word negritude. It probably would have gone unnoticed um, had not Jean-Paul Sartre wrote the introduction to Black Orpheus, right, which is the collection of neo, ne, um, new Negro poetry um, in the French context. Um, and he calls it, of course, an ugly word. But nonetheless, it is a word that embraces this idea of blackness. And so it is, it is how we came um, to this word negritude. But then there's other writings. In 1935, the Étudiant or Student Noir Journal, that the Black Student Journal that Césaire, Paulette Nodal, and the others have founded, um, we first get an inkling of what Césaire is, is trying to create. He creates another neologism, another new word, which he calls a negrity, all right? Or, you know, blackness or black things or however we want to interpret it. But this is the first kind of inkling of him making up words to try and describe blackness. Um, and then there's a second issue that I lately discovered, which is where I was beginning, going back to, um, that was also published. And not many people have begun to kind of mine that issue because Césaire goes in much more detail um, about revolutionary, about his uh, race consciousness. And Paulette Nodal is not in that issue. She's in the first issue in which they're also concerned with student things. It's an interesting kind of issue, but the second issue is particularly uh, political, and we really get to see more Césaire digging down into this idea of negritude. We also, Sangor is also published in there. Um, and they also, of course, include um, works by black American poets that they're particularly influenced by. Um, so the second issue, I think, is one in which people should 
you know, you can find it on the internet actually now. Um, it was in the archives at the Moreland Spingard Library for the longest. Um, Dama had given someone there a copy and they held on to it, uh, as sometimes archivists do, for a long time before they released it. And this person was nice enough to, of course, publish it on the internet. Um, but it, that's, a, that's a work that I think needs some more mining because in that work you'll get even more understanding of Césaire's kind of evolution and Songoa and Dama around this idea of negritude. It is interesting, as I said, the Nardal sisters are not included in that particular issue. It is a very male um, issue. Um, and this is where I think the, the gelling of uh, this, no, this idea of the three founders, the male movement, begins to really take form. Uh, later on, of course, we get the acknowledgement of the sisters' role uh, in the evolution of negritude and their development. Um, the sisters themselves, of course, Nadal writes that she's, you know, the men expressed it with much more flash and brio, as she says, their concepts. And she says, well, but what were we? We were just women. You know, um, and so we were kind of written out of the movement. But if you go to Martinique today, you have a square, Paulette Nodal. So there is recognition, um, not as much for Jane Nodal, because she kind of fell off after a while. She took ill. Um, but Paulette Nodal um, it was a force to be reckoned with on the island. So I think as we begin to think about negritude, we need to think about it in its completeness, in its totality, uh, with respect to its evolution and the ways in which there weren't just male um, founders or members, that these, these guys were really, really, these men were really, really impacted by these women and they were critical to their introductions. They weren't just introducing them, but also critical to the ideas that were shaping the movement. So that's just about it because you just stood up. All right, thank you. <laughs> Next to me is Rose. Uh, we're spending two times loud. We're going to do a couple of songs for y'all on this beautiful evening. Yes. So enjoy. Um, our first song, we're going to sing uh, two original songs for you. Tonight, when we end, at the end of the evening, we're going to do another song. We're going to begin with this first song now. Sounds the song of 
introduce you to uh, the panel. Uh, uh, I first want to call Josef uh, Jordan. He's currently a lecturer in, in teacher education at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences and uh, doctoral... Okay, I can do it so. And uh, I'll, I'll do it like, like this uh, again. Uh, I would like to introduce Josef Jordan. He's currently a lecturer in teacher education at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences and a doctoral candidate in English literature at Vanderbilt University. He is from Surinamese descent, was born and raised in the city of Amsterdam. Please uh, join us, uh, Joseph. Uh, Ines van der Scheer uh, is a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam 
researching Caribbean writing with a focus on work from Sylvia Winter and Edouard Glissant. She is also an active member and activist of University of Color uh, since its, its establishment in 2015. Please uh, join us. And of course, and of course I want to ask uh, Tracy and uh, also uh, Grass to join uh, the panel. And of course, uh, oh, Patricia. <laughs> again and Tracy for giving such a wonderful wonderful uh, um, lecture and thank you both for your beautiful song. I'm looking forward to the next song. I'm a fan, you know. Um, there are so many questions I could ask. You know, I already had to skip a couple of questions because you answered them already in your amazing, uh, amazing lecture and you as well. But um, what struck me actually was the relation between uh, uh, the Negritude movement and the Harlem Renaissance. And um, uh, there's a reason I asked this question, but I will explain to you later. Uh, could one of you, maybe you, Tracy, elaborate a little bit more about the importance of um, the influence of the Harlem Renaissance on Negritude? And maybe it's also something which worked vice versa. Well, I think the Harlem Renaissance is, of course, a movement um, that began in the United States. Um, typically, we situated in the 1920s, um, but it continued on into the 30s, but its most um, fecund um, moment of productivity was probably in the 20s. Um, and with that was a flourishing of poets and artists, um, as well as essentially poets and artists and, write, artists and writers, who were receiving a great deal of white philanthropy uh, in order to produce and support their work. Uh, there was a kind of collective uh, vanguard, if you will, of black men in particular, but there was also, um, it was a multi-racial kind of um, a collaboration, but there were certain men who were at the forefront in trying to get these monies from foundations, and also um, we had Du Bois's Crisis Magazine which was publishing the poets and the writers. And then we had Alain Locke, who of course we associate with his book, The New Negro. And Locke was of course also a, an avid art collector. So he was also really pushing African art um, and the embrace of African art and asking you know, African American artists to kind of think about African art as they began to um, work their crafts in different ways in this moment around diaspora. Um, and so Locke was in touch, Ellen Locke was in touch with, the, with other um, organizations attempting to raise money and to mount exhibits um, of these writers who had been excluded um, on the American stage, the larger American stage in terms of writing and art. Um, and so he was determined, of course, he was a Rhodes Scholar um, when he returned from Oxford. Um, he took up that mantle, he ended up at a job at Howard, and he wanted to, at Howard, create a center for African diasporic work. Um, he wanted Howard to be the place that people turned to when they thought about African art, um, when they thought about black writers, when they thought about this, 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 this um, fabulous uh, moment in time. He wanted to collect the artwork. He wanted to bring as many people in um, as he possibly could in order to situate Howard in this way. Researchers, et cetera. There's a wonderful biography that just came out on Locke called The New Negro, a biography of Ellen Locke by Jeffrey Stewart. It won a Pulitzer in the National Book Award. Um, it does very, very detailed work about how he attempted to build this New Negro movement. Um, and of course, there were others involved, like Du Bois. Jesse Fawcett was extremely important in nurturing um, these writers, um, and like Langston Hughes, uh, Claude McKay, um, Gwendolyn Bennett. There's so many of them um, that she was responsible for bringing to light, and she's often, again, papered over. She and Locke didn't get on very well, so you know he had no use for her. And of course, once Du Bois, you know, decided that they were done, that was it for Fawcett, and she began to kind of teach school. But the Brownies book was also 
uh, and her other vehicle in order to introduce African American children um, to the literary arts. Um, and so that didn't last quite as long, but she attempted to really do something across the spectrum, whether it was with youth or whether it was with these young poets. Um, so the Harlem Renaissance, its impact um, was quite global in the fact that once these artists began to win these fellowships from Carnegie and other places, they could travel abroad and they could interact um, with people like Césaire and Songor. And so this is how we get, and of course Locke was continuing to travel. Locke was a Europhile. So he went practically every year, every time he could get out of work at Howard, he would try and buy himself out so that he could go to Europe. Because in Europe, he felt free. You know, he was a short little homosexual man who was denigrated repeatedly in the United States and he had to hide in the closet for it. And it was in Europe where he felt he could be himself. Um, and so he was very much the Europhile. Um, fastidious um, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and so it was, it was just quite it was an interesting personality. Um, could be mercurial um, and nurturing uh, in you know, a matter of um, seconds. So, um, but he and others, once they were able to get this money, these artists began to travel, he traveled, and with them were these ideas that traveled, right? And so in many respects, these were traveling ideas uh, that were taking place and they would plant these seeds in different places and attempt to forge relationships so that the Harlem Renaissance itself and the New Negro movement uh, began to take root in different places and people appropriated them for their own purposes and so this is how we come to a negative movement. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I'm switching to Dutch. I should stay here in English. Um, I would like to show you a, a quote of the um, uh, author and Nobel Prize winner, uh, Rola Soyinka. Uh, can we have it on the screen, please? Um, so, Rola uh, Soyinka was not, such in a, not very much in favor of uh, the negritude. And, um, he says the following, I said, a tiger does not proclaim his stickritude, he pounces. In other words, a tiger does not stand in the forest and say, I'm a tiger. When you pass where the tiger has walked before, you see the skeleton of the duke. You know that some stickritude has been emanated here. <laughs> so, um, maybe I can ask Joseph, could you please respond to that, um, that quote? Um, I am a great lover of uh, Nigerian and Ghanaian literature and their authors. And um, I remember coming across this statement by um, Suyinka and thinking to myself, um, what a condemnation of a movement that was trying to affirm a particular kind of blackness. And um, I really appreciate that when you think about how different people have been colonized and how they might have a different relationship to coloniality, how that will shape the way they understand the significance of something like blackness. Because if you grow up in a context where blackness is a given or where you feel that your culture is not being denigrated or you can hark back to cultural traditions that are easily available to you, then it suddenly becomes much easier to say something like this as opposed to saying something like, I have to declare my blackness and make it stand because otherwise I will be <clears throat> assimilated into a particular kind of form of Eurocentrism or whiteness. Could you respond to that as well? Yes, um, I, I, I agree with what he said. I think it's very important uh, to be aware of the different contexts from which uh, they came from. Like Wolesi Yenka is a Nigerian author and he, came from, he comes from a British colonial context. And there, there are very uh, big differences between like the uh, British colonial rule and French colonial rule in Africa. So whereas, um, so for example, the British would, um, well, uh, but concerning like, um, uh, well, dealing with uh, subjects at, at, or um, 
matters that they were that weren't really of interest to them, they would uh, very much uh, let the local lo local rulers make the decisions about that. Indirect. So, so it so it was more about indirect rule for them in the, their uh, in the in the, their colonies in Africa, whereas um, the French were really into uh, mission civilisatrice. So it was real. Uh, it was a real uh, and a strict and. Um, Assimilation policy that they implemented in their uh, in their in their colonies in Africa. So, so yeah, so yes, uh, um, a Nigerian citizen would not have to, had to declare his blackness because it was as as Joseph Jordan just said a given. Well, for uh, uh, well for a, a black person, for an African in the fr in the French colonies, it was very uh, it wasn't a given because. Uh, the policy was very much directed to uh, trying to make these African people into black French people instead of letting them be, uh, maintain their culture. They really, so even uh, education was very much geared towards uh, 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 attempting to reach fr uh, Frenchness. Uh, well, this wasn't the case in the British colonies, so that's very, uh, very important to be aware of that dynamic. And, and can, can we bring that a little bit uh, closer to home, to, to the Netherlands, uh, for example? Maybe Ines, you can uh, answer this question. Um, so if we look at the way uh, 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 the French tried to basically uh, assimilate uh, uh, people from the, the, the colonies into their... Can we have the okay, comment please? Because, so, yeah, ahead, yeah. It's, so and it's, uh, I just wanted to add that this... Um, so that this notion of assimilating into Frenchness, that uh, this translate, that it is an ongoing uh, notion. So it's, you can still see very much see the differences between like the way uh, French people uh, French people deal with matters of migration, integration into the uh, into French society versus the uh, the way uh, the British deal with it. So for example, where. Uh, uh, in Great Britain or in England, um, they they don't really prioritize, uh, for example, the wearing of uh, of the niqab or the hijab the way the French do, because they see that as an affront to attempting uh, uh, to assimilate, integrate into French culture. Like you can't be French and wear a niqab, you can't be French and wear a hijab. Because they see the ideals of the uh, of the Enlightenment uh, as a very universal notion that everyone must uh, must attempt to reach. So that's just what I want to. That's just what I want to add. And and um, maybe she can. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you can. And also, also, Gras, um, can you compare it also with the situation here in the Netherlands regarding, uh, let's say, uh, the, the black community and the colonial history of the Netherlands? So you compare the UK and uh, uh, France, how about the Netherlands, how's the situation here? Because uh, the multicultural society yeah. has been declared dead by uh, several political uh, uh, figures here. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of discussion about integration of uh, migrants, uh, assimilation, so what is the status here now? So. Here you also see uh, this striving towards, well, they say they just want integration, but really they want assimilation. Because, um, because normally with, with integration, all you have to do is like, comply to the, uh, to, the, to the laws in a, in a, in a given a country. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that you have to give up your own, your, your own culture or your, or your own sense of self. Well, nowadays, well, it has started, it has been going on for uh, several years, but you see it more and more uh, in, in the recent years, that, um, that, they, that they also really try to push this uh, uh, idea of assimilation Towards uh, various uh, minority groups, and them, uh, and th that they see, uh, um, so that holding on to your own sense of self is is, be, is, is seen as a way of segregating yourself uh, from 
uh, from a larger Dutch culture. So they, sorry, so as if uh, Dutchness and uh, and blackness are mutually exclusive. Okay, thank you. And, and um, Ines, could you, could you uh, respond to this and also tell us a little bit about your research and maybe how it also relates to negative and also um, uh, movements like the, the Harlem Renaissance movements, etc. Sure, yeah. sure, yeah. Um, well, my research um, is very green still. Um, I started in October, but a lot of my um, interest is not only in um, just the pleasure of reading, you know, amazing um, and pretty well-known figures like Isan and Sylvia Winter, but also in unearthing um, like expressions of ancestral pride, of um, the relationship to um, black ancestry, African ancestry in my own um, context or my own background. So, um, Antillian, Dutch Antillian that would be. Um, and I think that this is so uh, shamefully underrepresented. Um, the work is not readily available. You have to ironically go to colonial archives to find even these writings. Um, and the, the publications that exist about it have been written also by white Dutch people and are very, um, what's noteworthy to me is that they're very I guess intent on reading anything but that expression of ancestral pride and that expression of um, solidarity with Africanness, with African identity. Um, so just attempting to retrieve the actual work from that kind of cesspool is um, an interesting project. Um, and luckily, um, I'm not doing it alone. So just a shout out to uh, Alfie Martis and um, Egbert Alejandro Martina, who are working on this as well, and are working currently, um, Egbert, on this incredible project um, that sees the Trinta de May uprising on Curacao, which has always been cast as a, as a labor issue, as a, as a proletariat issue. Um, Casting that and reading that through the lens of not just decolonization, but also as an abolitionist project. Um, yeah, sorry, I've gotten away from the question. Um, assimilation. Yeah, not a fan. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, it's, I don't think that's very tenable. I think it's a really interesting question um, for myself and my peers. Um, it's, I think, a known thing, for example, from Aruba that people come here at around age 18 to go to university um, after having, you know, all of our education in the Dutch colonial system, everything in Dutch, reading the same books as Dutch people, taking the same tests as Dutch people, and expecting to be Dutch here, you know, because you have a Dutch passport, you have the privilege of a Dutch passport, and finding that that's not the case. So in that sense, um, yeah, this really resonates. Um, I remember reading Black Skin, White Masks. That is something that um, I think is very, lends itself very much as well to people from a Dutch Caribbean context. And, and uh, can you reflect a little bit what you, you've heard from um, uh, Tracy and from Grass on the Negritude? Were you familiar with the those movements, uh, that this, that, that's one part of the question, and second is, um, the second part is, do you also see uh, something emerging here in the Netherlands? Um, our name uh, from, from the collective is Black Renaissance, and uh, we choose that because we are sensing that something is happening, there's some kind of black awakening happening. Do you also feel something like that? I definitely feel that, um, and I feel super privileged to be here in that moment. Um, I feel that very much as an activist, I have to say, more so than as an academic, because at the University of Amsterdam, at least, um, I'm the blackest person there. Um, yeah, as a, me as a student, you as a, as a teacher. Um, 
So, um, yeah, that. Sorry, what was the question? If you also uh, uh, see uh, oh, around yes, you the, some, yeah. some type of black renaissance uh, emerging here in the Netherlands, Definitely. because we have, um, for example, the, the black archives are, are, are uh, a very positive force, you know, uh, talking about erased uh, black histories. Um, we have uh, Simona Seyfert, she's here in the Netherlands as well, <laughs> decolonizing the museum. Um, we have a kick out of Swarte Piet, um, that's talking about this, this, this colonial figure. We have a lot of artists, we have writers. Um, so there, there's some, some uh, a type of under uh, uh, current, let's call it a black current, that's becoming almost a tidal wave, I think so. So in my opinion, we were kind of on the verge of some, some type of black renaissance. So I was wondering if, if you feel that as well. Uh, and I also, also would like to ask that question to, to, to Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, just briefly, definitely I feel that. Um, I think that's incredible. I think that as um, we're having these conversations, as we're getting together, as we are protesting more and more, are um, organizing our own spaces more and more, um, what I think is cool as well is like a distinctly black voice is emerging um, from what maybe used to be cast as like autochtone or just more broadly migrant background. Um, so for that, I'm, yeah, absolutely I see that in the projects that you mentioned, in the initiatives that you mentioned, of course. Um, and. It's a privilege to, to be a part of it, to sit here, of course. Um, yeah. Okay, and, and Josef, do you, do you also, uh, can you relate to that or elaborate on that a little bit more as well? I think it's a, quite an interesting question because um, I've been living abroad for quite some time and I've been going away and coming back and I've seen things change over time. I remember the time when I was the only person in high school protesting against what to beat. And I know that this has changed significantly in terms of the public presence of activism against racism. And I'm not saying um, there was no activism against racism before, because there was. But there's a way in which we have caught the public eye with the things that we say. And there's also a way in which I feel that um, the Dutch public sphere is being held accountable and that we demand some kind of um, redress to the things that are being said that are harmful, spiteful, um, negative. <clears throat> in, a similar, in a similar sense, I also think that um, I see people developing different forms of black consciousness. On the one hand, um, there's a way in which um, we orient ourselves or we, we look very much towards the United States and we look very much at what um, African American cultural production in order to understand ourselves and we use concepts from, you know, whether it be literature or scholarship or art to inform ourselves and build ourselves up and to say, you know, this is actually a diasporic movement, this is a diasporic connection, um, we're all in this together. What for me becomes very significant is the way we start to think about ourselves here um, and the things that we feel will be a contribution towards that discussion. So that, for example, I'm more interested in the way we, um, the people who perhaps grew up here or grew up in, you know, the overseas territories, former territories, not so, not so former territories, um, basically elaborate on and push the conversation further rather than sticking with what scholarship in the United States has produced about a particular problem. And I, I, some of my dear friends know this very well, I will say this like repeatedly, um, you need to advance the conversation because the empirical situation that we are facing is not the same as African Americans in the United States or black people in the Caribbean. There's a way in which what happens here <clears throat> has a unique value and it deserves to be studied. But the last thing I'll say about this too is, I am deeply concerned about the ways in which black people here might see Dutchness as an aspirational thing. And that they, there is a way in which I find that a lot of black people here understand themselves as Dutch, which I do not, even though I was born and raised there. Mm -hmm. And I place like severe question marks at this notion because there's such assumptions about um, 
can something like diaspora critically challenge European frameworks of thinking about legality, the way we understand ourselves, and the way we understand ourselves in relationship to other communities in the world? I think we also should, uh, uh, in this whole discussion, we really should honor and address Professor Dr. Gloria Becker and Professor Dr. Philomena Essent, um, who were very important on, on making uh, us aware that whiteness is an ethnicity as well. And I think that is something which changed the whole, um, that many things changed, but we're talking about you know, what is changing this is also a part of the Renaissance, you know, that we look at whiteness in a different way. And um, so I just, I, that's, I wanted to address that and thank you for um, you, both your elaborate answers to the question. Um, I completely agree that we have to look at our own geography and also our own locality. But um, uh, at the same time, I think it's also important to be aware that we we stand on the shoulders of others. <laughs> and that we know, Absolutely. you know, what those shoulders have carried. And this is what we need to make our own story and our own narrative. It's a continuation of the yeah. conversation. Yeah, but I completely agree with you that the Dutch context is really a typical Dutch context, which you cannot compare, even with Germany, France, or England. So. Um, but saying this, I uh, do have a question. And uh, I want to go back to the negritude, and, um, um, and I wanted to, to, to read a short quote of uh, Aimé Césaire, which he said, uh, you know, when he was at the, uh, almost at the end of his life. Um, and I also want to, uh, before I do this, say this quote, I also want to say that I really appreciate the work you're doing uh, concerning negritude women because we are talking a lot about the men, but the women have been incredibly important in um, not only the negritude, but in the many, many, many uh, struggles for freedom. And a lot of these black women have been erased. So we stand on the ground of black women, so we have to keep that in mind as well. Anyway, um, towards the end of his life, Aimé Césaire has declared that the question he and his friend Leopold Sebor, Sedar Sebor came to raise after they first met was, who am I? Who are we? What are we in this wide world? And he commented, hmm, that's quite a problem. Who am I? Is a question that was, and a reader of the French philosopher naturally understands such a question to be universal. And the subject who says I, here, stands for any human being. But when who am I has to be translated as who are we? Everything changes, especially when the we have to define themselves against the world, which leaves no room for who and what they are, because they are black folks in a world where universal, universal seems to naturally mean white. Negritude, or the self-affirmation of black peoples, or the affirmation of the values of civilization, of something defined as the black world, as an answer to the question, what are we in this wide world is indeed quite a problem. So my question is, with this in mind, and I think I ask it to you, uh, is, do you think that the who am I question of Césaire is still accurate for black people within the European context? And is the universal still white? <clears throat> Well, I don't want to necessarily speak for <laughs> all of those in a particular in the European context, but I do think is if we think about um, various countries and cultures um, in Europe, I would probably argue that yes, the universal is definitely still white, um, and um, disentangling um, this the very the identity of whether it be Frenchness, Dutchness. Spanishness, Englishness, whatever, um, in these contexts, um, still, um, as Grace um, wonderfully said, 
there's this idea that blackness and this particular identity are mutually ex exclusive. Um, and so, <clears throat> whether, what I find fascinating um, about Cesare's um, question, of course, is, you know, it, it has very much Du Boisian um, influences, and we have heard it ring out later in Fanon, right, in The Wretched of the Earth, when he talks about the colonized, and that is, of course, the question that is constantly plaguing the colonized, um, and even those in the post-colony. Um, I do think that in the French context in particular, um, in which I'm most familiar with, and uh, around the globe, in this global context, I think that, but let me look specifically in France, that there is now an understanding of the who am I question, uh, and that becomes that they are French blacks, uh, or black French. Uh, and there's a great deal of movement around it. There are movements that have been started, some of them modeled after um, mm -hmm. the NAACP, um, which of course, in the context of the United States, is practically um, not especially influential anymore. But for the, in the French context, it was very much important to have a movement that actually talked about race. Um, and that was forcing um, census takers, or attempting to, to begin to uh, allow people to, or at least to identify people uh, according to race. There's still very much resistance. I don't think that that's going to happen. But it becomes very difficult to, to talk about civil rights when you are not even um, counted. Right? Um, so it's a very, it's a frustrating question because you can't talk about black people being wronged when there's no such thing as black people uh, in the French context. And so, and then amongst them, there are certain tensions. But I do think that there is a working out now of this idea of who, I, who am I um, in France, outside of France, in the former colonies. There is a bit more latitude, having just been in Paris, to see even so many more posters and different voices um, on billboards is a fascinating thing to see. It wasn't there when I first began to study um, in France. Um, and the, the number of black people um, in France. Um, so that has forced a kind of reckoning, reckoning and recognition um, of that difference, but that can, that, that can still share uh, a same history. Um, so I do think that there is definitely movement on that front, and I think Césaire would be quite impressed to see that where he started, and that there was so much resistance, and which is why he was still at the end of his life attempting to defend negritude, right? I mean, people were like going after him repeatedly about negritude. Um, that at the end, that he would see now that there, has, there was some headway, that people began to understand that they have to entertain the difference that blackness makes in the context of France. Um, if you don't, you don't really, you won't really have the, the answer to why, you know, you exist differently. Um, and what, what are, why there are these vast differences between white French and black French, um, and those newly coming over having their identity constantly questioned, even if they were born um, as citizens of France in those different places. Get a sign from the back. I think it's time. Why not? Yes. Oh wow. Um, huh? Maybe one more question uh, for, um, uh, for Gross. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I have a question too, actually, but they are related because I'm really curious about the negritude women. Uh, you know, could you? Could you consider them being feminist? Um, Nadal, Nadal, and Suzanne Césaire? Would you consider them feminist? Um, yes, I would, because uh, Paulette Nadal was very much concerned also about uh, the position of women in, uh, in the island of Martinique and uh, very much writing um, writing a lot about uh, yes about this question of womanhood in Martinique, but although 
it may be a more what, conservative feminism that we than that we are used to nowadays, because she, I, I found her writing to be very Catholic and very traditional when it when it comes to like womanhood and motherhood. So he's, yeah, so it's it is feminist but like very conservative and traditional. Outside. And classic 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 also. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's what, what uh, the black women were also facing this triple uh, oppression. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I think I, I think I'm sorry. I think we're out of time. So um, unless somebody has to have like an urgency to pose, I'm looking at. Okay. So, so oh. there, there may be uh, some Great. final remarks from uh, from all the. Yeah. The, Maybe the just if you want panels. to elaborate on the who am I question or. Is there somebody else? Uh, something else you said? Like, wow, I would like to. Uh. I guess, um, and this is perhaps a, a little bit of an addendum. Um, one would be a concern with the kind of acceptance of Dutchness as an aspirational goal. And you know, some of us are absolutely not interested in being Dutch or being told that what's in your passport is what you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that the other aspect is rather than the, placing the question, who am I? I think that the question, who are we, is something that we need to think about. Yeah, yeah. And who are we in relationship to each other? Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why I went to study abroad is because I was particularly interested in the experience of black people abroad. I wanted to see, you know, I mean, I grew up here. I grew up in a historically black neighborhood which is now being aggressively gentrified in the Belmont. And um, there were people from across the diaspora in my classroom. There were no white children in my classroom until I w went to secondary school. Um, and it is with that particular orientation that I understood myself as a black person in relationship to these other black people from the Caribbean, from Africa. Going to England and encountering more of that, going to the United States and encountering more of that was significant to me so that the idea of the nation state controlling your, under, your understanding of yourself or conditioning the way you understand yourself in relationship to other black populations, I think, is something that we really have to work through because our imaginations of freedom may not be limited by what a European nation state tells us what it is. Here, here. Thank you. I, said, I, I agree absolutely with what he said because uh, a lot of the times uh, when we come, uh, like in these movements where people, black people are trying to define themselves, a lot of times you get a feeling like it's always like pushing, only pushing back against whiteness and like defining yourself against, up against whiteness. And indeed, I think it's much more interesting in um, thinking about the way we relate to each other. Because some of the things that uh, uh, Fanon and Césaire wrote about when it comes to like dynamics between Afro-Caribbeans and people from the African continent, they also play uh, play here. I grew up, I, I myself, I'm from the Congo, from the continent. I grew up in uh, North Brabant, in the south of Holland, uh, where uh, the, uh, most of the black population consisted of people from Curaçao. And uh, back then, like I grew up in the 90s, there were like uh, sometimes difficult dynamics between people from the Caribbean and people from the African continent, where people from the Caribbean sometimes um, uh, like what 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 is there from all this part, like looking down sometimes again uh, looking down on people from the continent because they have a Dutch pass passport etc. And I think it's uh, like when I you see some changes there are some changes like nowadays where uh, black activists are more and more affirming um, yeah the solidarity with each other and also more uh, more into like discovering their own Africanness. And I think that is like more um, uh, development that we uh, should uh, continue to reflect on, like the way on which we uh, uh, relate to our common uh, shared history and the way we continue to relate to each other based on that. Yeah. Uh, Ines, uh, final uh, uh, comment? Um, well, yeah, there's not much to add, just thank you. Um, yeah, I, um, I think it's really good that you brought that up because I think that's um, 
like a huge issue for, um, well, at least people from, I can speak from my island, for Aruba, the denial of African ancestry, and then also looking down on continental African people. Um, yeah, I think we have to hold ourselves accountable to that and not just be like, you know, we're into it now, we're feeling, you know, the moment and get all in touch with our roots without undoing um, our participation in the dehumanization of our brothers and sisters, for sure. Yeah, I think it's good that we uh, are aware that uh, identity is not a fixed thing. It's, it's a loose thing. We consist for 80% of water. So why should we should behave like that and also should approach our identities like that and be fluid in our identities. There's a beautiful quote of James Baldwin. I'm looking at the James Baldwin issues. <laughs> and identity is only questioned when the stranger enters the gates. So it's better to wear your identity like a loose rope, like the, from the people in the desert, and always be discerned of one's nakedness underneath it. Was it you? <laughs> Tracy, anything you want to add? No. no? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, then let's, uh, also want to thank the audience for listening. Yeah, absolutely. Any? Yeah. Hi. I have a quick question, and I hope the organizers are hearing it. But next year will mark the 100th um, year of the Harlem Renaissance, to what you're considering your Black Renaissance. So that would be a celebration of the centennial that you all are very interested in looking at that. But I will also beg to look into the identity for Joseph and Tracy, because Tracy, you're from the United States and looking back into, and so I would love to see how the conversation will work between you two. Um, what can be anticipated or what can be considered um, that has been influential from the American side, the US side? And then for Joseph here, what can we learn from the United States so that we may not make the same mistakes again, a hundred years later? <laughs> Well, that won't be going to do in the bar. <laughs> because we have to, I'm sorry, it's, it's the, yeah, um, uh, it's time runs fast. I hope you enjoyed yourself, I did. Um, maybe, I, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, yeah, I know we're going to do one more song, but I, I still want to thank everybody for being here. And we have one more song from 22 times now. The beautiful girls, talented girls. Um, and here then I'll share it with I'm not sure. Uh, we will uh, close it up right now. Yeah. You know, I also want to thank every uh, one from Black Renaissance, um, Rosa uh, Tevelde, Rosa in the back, Rosa in the back, uh, Imelda Chonfo, um, Damaira Anais, Saudi Sandvliet, Saudi Sandvliet, and Nancy Hoffman. Okay. <laughs> the Holland Festival for uh, inviting us to organize this program. Thank you very much uh, for giving us the space. And um, on June 14, we will have another program which is about the post-colonial body. So if you have time and are interested, please uh, uh, join us then. And we have again a wonderful uh, uh, panel and group of artists. And, um, yeah. and thank you, Antoine. Thank you as well. Uh, for <laughs> <laughs> okay,
bringing us what they know, their knowledge, and I think this is so important, especially for us in the Netherlands, to learn. Because these are things that we need, these are subjects we need to hear about and we need to learn. And if we don't learn it at school, if we don't get it at school, then we need to do it like this. So, thank you. We're just going to sing a love song for you now. <laughs> uh, just to keep it very light. And, um, yeah, just let it soak in what we've been talking about.
מיומנים,